It's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. You ready, Pat? Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to March the 23rd State Government Committee meeting here. A little overcast today here in Nashville. But anyway, we're not going to let that damper our spirits, of course, not at all. With that, we're going to turn to Ms. Robbins, uh, our clerk. And Ms. Robbins, would you take the roll, please? Representatives Alexander, Beck, Here. Bricken, Here. Carr, Here. Carringer, Chisholm, Here. Cooper, Halford, Here. Helton, Holesclaw, Holsey, Here. Jernigan, Johnson, Here. Littleton, Here. Marsh, Here. Moon, Here. Powell, Here. Wendell, Here. Vice Chairman Eldridge, Here. Chairman Keesling. Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Wonderful. Then that means we can put it in gear and get going here. Again, we want to welcome everyone, members to you, particularly those also uh, sitting here in our committee room and joining us today. But never we, shall we forget those of you who may be viewing in from wherever, from wherever. That's the way to leave it right there. So with that, members to you, are there any announcements or personal orders from you, the committee? I see none. So let us, uh, of course, our first order of business is turning our attention to Chairman Carr. Chairman Carr has joined us. He's back in Nashville this week. It's uh, we, we did miss you. Yes, we did miss Chairman Carr last week, and we so noted that, Chairman, by the way. I don't know if you were viewing, or, uh, viewing in or not, but we did. And thank you. Would you, uh, being that your name has been called, would you want to, to make any comments, sir? Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Committee, for thinking about me. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, sir, for your service. Okay, let us not ever forget this day in history. Let's turn our attention to this day in history, 1775. Patrick Henry. He, yes, it was he who gave his famous speech to the Second Virginia Convention during which he uttered his most famous quote, and there's not anyone in this room that can't, quote, give me liberty or give me death. That's right. This speech is considered to have helped sway Virginia, then the most populous and prosperous of the colonies, into joining the bu bubbling or budding revolutionary movement. Number two, let's go to 1806. Having reached the Pacific Coast after nearly two a two-year expedition, it was Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. They began their return journey from the West Coast this day in 1806, charting new lands of the American West and cat uh, cataloging numerous local species of animals and dozens of Native American tribes. And finally, in 1945, the U.S. Naval Forces began a multiple-day artillery barrage of the Japanese island Okinawa. The Battle of Okinawa would properly begin on March the 26th. However, it would be the largest battle of the uh, Pacific Theater during World War II. That is your day in history. Now let us turn our attention. We will, uh, we, we will begin and we'll turn our attention to our calendar, if you will. Uh, uh, item number one. House Joint Resolution 10. And uh, Leader Lambert, you are recognized, sir. Welcome. I have a motion and a second. Leader Lambert, would you proceed and present us this resolution, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd like to give Chairman Curcio credit for being particularly interested in your days in history. He was riveted. So just so you know, uh, on this particular resolution, this is something we passed last year. Uh, this would be the second General Assembly that hopefully would be successful in it is literally a cleanup 
of the line of succession issues on when the governor may be temporarily out. This dates all the way back to the Bredesen days um, when he had gone through a temporary illness and there really wasn't anything in the Constitution. So if this were to be successful, it would set up how the lieutenant governor would step in if necessary, um, you know, in a temporary, temporary issue if the governor is unavailable to be able to serve during that time period. Got you well, well, ex well explained. And my apology, uh, leader, to you, I uh, missed a. I, I stated a House joint. It is uh, members is Senate joint resolution. Any questions to Leader Lambert? Got a question? I heard the call for the question. I see no objection. Therefore, it'll allow us to vote for uh, Senate joint resolution ten. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. And Leader, you're on to finance, ways, and means, sir, with that one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope they're half as kind to me as you've been. Thank you. Thank you. you please remain right there. You're coming in. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Item number two. Thank you, Chairman or Leader. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, item number two, House Bill 72 by Chairman Halsey. Chairman Halsey, at your seat, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. For those of you who got a motion and a second, I heard a second. Thank Proceed, you. Chairman. For, for those of you who weren't in the subcommittee, um, this bill came out of the Criminal Justice Task Force from 2019. Um, in the last 10 years, the incarcerated population aged 50 and older in Tennessee has increased 51 percent. And uh, in fact, in 2018, there was over 1,776 individuals aged 60 and over in in uh, Tennessee prisons. Uh, by the way, that number is uh, enough for one penitentiary to stand alone. Chairman Hulsey, if I may interrupt, we, you do have an amendment on this one, and you may be, in my apology, you may be explaining the amendment. We do need to get this amendment on there. Can you give us your tracking code, sir? You know, I do not have the amendment. Well, allow me to help you. How does 4373 sound, members? Do you all see that? All right. It is, uh, it is a friendly amendment, and do I have a motion? What is I have a motion and a second on the uh, on on the amendment. Chairman Hulsey, you may proceed. Again, my apologies, sir. Okay, thank you. The, on the amendment, please. Yes, on the you, amendment, the amendment just says if somebody falls into the category that we have designed for you, that I'm going to give you in this bill the representative or senator in the district that this inmate's from will be notified. Very good. Good explanation. Any questions to the sponsor regarding the amendment? The regarding the amendment, we got a question called. Do I, I don't see any objections to the call of the question. Therefore, allow us to vote on amendment number one, tracking code 4373. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes have it. Chairman Hudson, we're back now on your on your bill, 72, sir. Any closing remarks? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We spend uh, roughly two to three times more to, to, to take care of, of geriatric folks. And under the existing law in Tennessee, the only uh, remedy we have is called a medical furlough, and it's a pretty high bar. In fact, we're, we're one of the stiffest states in, in Tennessee with medically uh, impaired folks in, in the penitentiary. But it says you have to be in imminent peril of death and you cannot take care of yourself in a prison <clears throat> environment. This bill does two things. It, it changes the existing law and it provides a mechanism for chronically debilitated or incapacitated inmates to be certified for parole consideration if the inmate's at least 70 years of age and he's served at least five years in custody and he's not in prison for a violent sex offense or life without parole. And at that point, they have to have two sworn affidavits from uh, one of them from the, the department's medical officer, officer certifying that the inmate condition is chronic, that it's incurable, that it will likely result in the inmate's death within one year. The other part of it changes the verbiage for this medical furlough and says, in this case, an inmate, if his prognosis is mortality within a year or he can no longer take care of himself. And the reason I'm saying this is important, we have some inmates that are million dollar, million dollar inmates. The state actually purchased its own dialysis machine for the number of inmates that are going through kidney dialysis. So um, 
this is a, a common sense approach, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Questions to Chairman Halsey? Do I hear a call for the question? I do. I see no objections. Therefore, allow us to now vote for House Bill 72 as amended. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes. Have it. And Chairman, you, uh, congratulations. You're headed to calendar and rules. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Thank you very much. Please note, uh, committee, that item number three, House Bill 348, has been taken off notice. Let's move on down to item number four that we are going to recognize at this time. That's House Bill 1347. We have a motion and a second. Uh, let's see. We I see no amendments. We're going to turn our attention now to you, Chairman Curcio. Good. Uh, welcome. Welcome on board, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please I always proceed. enjoy the history of the day. Give me liberty or give me death. That was great. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, members, the bill you have before you, House Bill 1347, was actually born out of a um, uh, something that was brought to light during a fiscal review committee and uh, had to do with the powers that we granted to the executive branch. These are not powers that the governor has an inalienable right to. Rather, they are powers that we shared with the governor. Uh, and we say during state of an emergency um, that the governor may create uh, executive agencies, any, any number of other boards, things like that. Um, but what I didn't realize and what I think most Tennesseans didn't realize is that when one of those is created, they also can have procurement budgets. They can have employees. They can have all sorts of things. And this came out during a conversation in committee where there was a contract of about $26 million that had been signed. And I asked a very simple question, which was, at what point will this contract come before the General Assembly? When will, when will the people have oversight over this process? And the response was never. And I said, well, help me understand that. I've sat on GovOps. I've sat on fiscal review. And we, we typically um, get to review those things. Departments and agencies have sunsets. And the response was, but this is not a typical agency. This was created under the governor's emergency powers. And because of that, there is no sunset. There is no oversight by the General Assembly. And I want to stand before you today as a Tennessean to say, I completely agree that pandemics or other natural disasters create states of emergencies. I think our executive branch needs the ability to move quickly and unilaterally when that's appropriate. But I also can imagine a time when someone could absolutely abuse that power. And so what this bill would do is it does not take away the ability for the executive branch to, to create one of these things. It simply defines executive agency and it says as the governor, uh, the executive branch creates one of these, then within 60 days, they've got to go before the GovOps committee to figure out whether or not it needs to continue. And that simple amount of oversight, I think, uh, is something that our constituents would expect is reasonably happening anyway. Again, just like every department or agency has a sunset now and has oversight. Um, but I think if we're not careful, uh, left up to someone less scrupulous. I mean, think about if Ray Blanton had this authority and we were sitting here and we didn't know the right questions asked. Well, have you created a secret agency this week, Governor? It begs the question. So um, I don't think that this was the original intent of the emergency powers. And so we just want to create uh, some guardrails there to make sure that we can look at that. Chairman Curcio, we have, uh, and members, we, we do have requests for testimony. Uh, and, and I'll turn my uh, to you, uh, Chairman. Do you want to now uh, accept or address any questions or shall we uh, wait and go ahead and allow testimony and then, and then, conclude with I'll, I'll do whichever you prefer sir I'm, I would I'm at the prefer let's go ahead and and, and do testimony Absolutely. if that's okay with you if there's no objections we're going to go out of out of session and we're going to ask our favorite from the governor's office Ms. Yancey to come right on up proceed if you would you know the routine 
Ms. Yancey, identify yourself and your position, if you would. And we, uh, we, uh, we're going. We have the. Uh, we have. How about five minutes? We're going to give you five minutes. Val. I hope it won't take that long. The clock. Okay, go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committee members. I do appreciate it very much. You got your phone. You, you got the phone. Okay, there you go. Thank you. I think so. Okay. All right. um, it is the intent of Title 58, Chapter 2, to provide for the coordination of activities relating to emergency preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation among and between agencies and officials of this state. Last March and April, states were fighting tooth and nail with each other, competing for a very limited supply of personal protection equipment, or PPE, so that our healthcare workers and first responders could be protected. Speed and adaptability were critical to seize on ever-changing market conditions and opportunities. So fast forward to 2021. We feel it's too early to make changes to the governor's executive powers. We do not yet have the benefit of hindsight from this emergency. Emergency management has many moving parts and complex features that touch all aspects of state government. And we need to fully evaluate how those parts work together before we change the system. Um, Tennesseans are still grappling with the ongoing emergency and flexibility is still essential to Tennessee's recovery. This bill would limit Governor Lee's management of the current emergency. We don't feel like we should change the rules in midstream. This bill would affect every type of emergency in the future. <clears throat> it is not limited to pandemics or health-related emergencies. Even if it were limited that way, events such as earthquakes and floods often wipe out key infrastructure like water and sewer systems and rapidly become health emergencies as well. <clears throat> emergencies develop at breakneck speed. There are an infinite number of decisions that must be made literally around the clock. Vast resources, including emergency personnel, may need to be deployed at a moment's notice. Systems and processes must be developed to get information, supplies, and people where they need to be uh, instantly. The governor can effectively and simultaneously address all of these dynamics at the front end. This bill would impose committee review on the governor's management choices while an emergency is underway, but it's not clear what the committee oversight is intended to solve. Governor Lee did not create a governmental entity to respond to the emergency. He did create, uh, oh, excuse me, he did create a framework for his cabinet and trusted advisors to keep abreast of the latest developments and brainstorm and implement appropriate responses. This is precisely the type of collaboration that supports good emergency leadership. Moreover, the, the committee review this bill contemplates may be impossible during certain types of emergencies, like a natural disaster that prevents enough committee members from getting to Nashville. The provision regarding eliminating procurement and contracting flexibility is a very troubling aspect of the bill from the governor's perspective. Procurement and contracting flexibility were among the most essential elements of Tennessee's emergency response. As I stated earlier, Tennessee was racing to get essential supplies like PPEs for our hospital workers and schools. We had to aggressively fight for supplies against every state, every hospital, and truly every country around the world. Tennessee would have lost vital contacts, contracts for PPEs and other critical supplies without the flexibility that you all had allowed. That flexibility would go away if this bill passes. It would hamstring access to supplies and it adds extra time that between Tennesseans and scarce emergency supplies when they are needed the most. For example, if a natural disaster knocks out electricity in your community, which it does on, am I there? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep which trucking. It, okay, which it does on a regular basis. Um, generators and fresh water are needed immediately. This would prevent your constituents from giving the, getting those supplies quickly. Rather than procuring supplies immediately, the state might be forced to go through red tape on the front end and supplies could arrive too late. 
Contracts are subject to the comptroller's oversight and review from this body. And it's important that we don't that we not uh, prevent Tennesseans from getting emergency supplies when they need them. Um, Ten seconds. Pal. Okay, I think I can wrap it up. Can you I think wrap I it? have made my point. So you, yes, sir. We. Do, I think so. Thank you. Okay. Well, no. Stay. Please remain seated. You have some questions forthcoming. We have a request, and we're going to begin with Chairman Jernigan. Chairman, you're oh, thank, recognized. Thank you. I appreciate your, your testimony. I want to make two points. One point is I, you talk about now is not the right time because of a pandemic, but I've seen a dozen bills go through health and this committee where you're deferred on and watching. But it seems like we're cherry-picking on which ones that you want to, to do here. Second is I sit on fiscal review. Kirstie, I've been on fiscal review for, for three years now. I don't think it takes away the flexibility. You still have the flexibility. We're just saying that 60 days later that we have some oversight because in that committee, I saw where the you know the commissioner unilaterally made a decision, got the PPE or or looked for the vaccines, and it was it was not a good thing. It was not a good contract. And I understand what you have to do quickly, but we're just saying 60 days later that we can address this and say, hey. Um, there's a conflict of interest here, or, you know, there is um, not nothing competitively bid here or sole source. And I get all that. We're just saying a little oversight. Your flexibility remains the same. If it's a natural disaster, do it a little, little ways down the road. Let us look at it and, and, and say, Hey, uh, this is a good idea. This is not a good idea. And it's what the legislative branch does. That's our role. And that's part of a, uh, checks and balances. So I, I think it's a good bill. I don't know if you want to comment on the flexibility part and having some oversight two or you know two months later, which I think is appropriate, but nothing takes away from the flexibility of you having to make a game time decision. Would you want to respond, uh, yes. Ms. Yancey? Yes, sir, if you I may. You may proceed. Um, any contract that was entered into uh, under the Unified Command Group, which that's the group that was put together by the governor to coordinate all these activities, all those contracts either went through TEMA or they went through the Department of Health. And both of those organizations are subject to the comptroller's audits automatic. I mean, they just are. That's <clears throat> part of it. So I was a little confused by the response by that person saying you would never see that contract because we actually presented that contract. We went back and watched the tape to make sure I didn't get this wrong, but the commissioner had a copy of that contract there and it was shared. And I mean, we can do it again and it is subject to an audit. I think our big concern on the 60 days is if we're in a situation where things could be much worse than the pandemic we've had. Um, you know, there's so many opportunities or so many situations yeah. where a natural disaster could happen that could hamstring the legislature from getting here in 60 days. So if that happens, are we putting the governor into a position where he is breaking the law by trying to help the citizens of the state when you can still have access to any of those contracts through the audit process, it's naturally in place for departments. Chairman Jernigan. I, well, I, I think to me it's it's an, it's an old trust and verify situation, and I don't think it's a problem for GovOps so that they meet monthly to get down here in a situation. But uh, I understand your concerns. Those are mine, and I appreciate your testimony. Follow up, Ms. Yancey. Follow up. No, sir. I no. Okay. Let us move on. Speak. Speaker Marsh, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm, I want to go back to the like the last year emergency purchases. And uh, were they or are they not uh, audited by someone? I, I think you mentioned the comptroller audits all of them. Yes, sir. And how quickly does do, are they audited? And, Ms. Yancey. Do we get those, does the legislature get those reports from the comptroller on what they with the findings yes sir i i'm sorry i don't have the answer on how quickly the comptroller audits i mean i know they're in an audit cycle because fiscal review gets those audits and um so i'm not sure about that timeline 
but all the contracts that we have done up till now either went through TEMA or the Department of Health. So while the Unified Command Group would coordinate how to do them, they were signed off by either the TEMA director or the Commissioner of Health, and those then become part of the audit process. Now, TEMA also has mm -hmm. under... Um, I'm sorry, my mind just went blank. It's under a powers act with the federal government. They have some purchasing power and FEMA audits those contracts, but that's not state money, that's federal. So they all are audited some kind of way they sooner or later. They are all subject to the audit, yes, sir. Well, that makes us feel better. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any further questions? Yes, we do. Representative Powell, you're recognized. Um, thank you. I and, and I under, understand your points. I mean, I do have reservations about removing uh, the governor's powers in emergencies. I mean, I think that that is, is essential and, and, and hate to, to ponder that. Although, uh, you know, there were certain purchases I know that were made that the, the public has been unhappy about, members of the General Assembly have been unhappy about. And, um, you know, the, specifically the, the, the mass, the sock mass, I yeah. mean, that was a, a huge fiasco. Um, and so, you know, I think that having a little bit more oversight can be productive and making sure that, um, that we're really, um, going about these, these purchasing and these contracts in a, in a very, um, and I get, unfortunately states were put in this bidding war with one another. Um, I wish the federal government would have done more, uh, to procure those different items, um, uh, much earlier in the pandemic and not for states to, um, compete against each other so much. But that was a situation we put in. Hopefully, the federal government has learned from that. And moving forward, if we are put in the situation again, we'll, we'll act differently. But um, I, I mean, I think as described, what I see in this bill makes sense that it, it's good for us to have some oversight because I was getting a lot of calls uh, personally from people of my constituents who were not happy with some of the different things that were bought um, by the by the executive uh, of the state of Tennessee. So. Um, you know, happy to respond, but that's that's my thoughts on the matter. Thank you. Ms. Yancey, response? Okay. Further questions to, to Ms. Yancey? While we have her cornered, I see none. All right. Uh, Val, thank, thank, you, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. We're going to go back in and we're going to return. If there's no objection, we're going to return to... Uh, uh, come out of recess and we're back into session. Thank you, sir. We're going to now direct our attention back to you, Chairman Curcio. You have heard the testimony. Would you like to uh, uh, address any, maybe any questions or maybe comments from you, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And again, I want to go back to the question was, wait a minute. I, you know, I sit on fiscal review. I thought single source, no bid contracts came to fiscal review. I thought that was the point. Interjection was made. Well, that's because the commissioner didn't sign in their capacity as commissioner. This person signed as unified command. So with the stroke of a pen, I can now step outside of the oversight of the General Assembly in the state of Tennessee, the folks who elect us, and decide which hat I could wear at which time. And that is what gave me pause. Again, I'm not saying there's not a time and a place for it. I'm just saying, can we come back on the back end and make sure that we've got the oversight that we need? So be happy to answer any questions. Certainly. Me. All right, and we do. Chairman Halsey, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just in one piece of the bill that I didn't understand. Um, after 60 days, government ops looks at this, and then it says that, that it'll make recommendations on the continuation or discontinuation to the General Assembly within and then the five day period of that is i'm assuming if we're not in session how does that transpire chairman curcio thank you sir for the question yes you're you're reading it exactly right and um i've sort of been very open to any suggestions from the administration on how to you know wordsmith that if they had any concerns that no no suggestions came back uh and so after much consultation you know with other house members and and talking about kind of what we saw and heard during that uh, fiscal review committee, we felt that this was the most appropriate way to go forward. Uh, I did uh, also, you know, take into consideration the fact that GovOps does meet quite frequently. Uh, I looked at at various timetables, six months, a year, what have you, and and ultimately this is kind of kind of what came back. So, absolutely. 
Because I, I think when there's that much money at stake, we the people's voice needs to be heard. Chairman Halsey, follow up. Okay, Chairman Halsey says uh, enough's enough there with him. We're going to now direct our uh, attention to, uh, we're going to recognize you, Speaker Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Curcio, was there an agency created during the pandemic? Chairman Curcio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if we look at the short answer, my view is yes. Uh, because, and as I define executive agency here uh, in the bill, any agency, authority, board, commission, department, office, or quasi-governmental entity in the executive branch of state government, or any independent entity of state government that is created by the use of the governor's emergency powers pursuant to this chapter. That's what surprised me, was that unified command, I knew about unified command, I was very happy that unified command existed. What I was surprised to hear was that it had a staff, it had a procurement budget, had the ability to sign contracts. Speaker Johnson. So there was an agency created? In Chairman. My, in my opinion, yes, sir. And, and that was the unified command? Okay. My next question, we're talking about 60 days. If there is a, another pandemic worse than this one or a natural disaster where the body cannot get back together, the committee can't get back together, what would the remedy be? Chairman. This bill does not contemplate that. I mean, the timetable is laid out. Uh, again, I've solicited, you know, any sort of feedback as far as timetable from the executive branch, but, but ultimately got none. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, we have Chairman Hallford. Chairman Hallford, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and to the chairman over here, um, I served on GovOps for several years, and uh, I always understood that they had three options. He could either give a positive review, a, a motion, or a negative, or none at all. So how does that initiate any action um, by, by government, government ops giving any um, opinion? Chairman Curcio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're creating it in this bill. So it gives them the ability to make a recommendation. It says the Joint Evaluation Committee shall make a recommendation on the continuation or the discontinuation. So they're making a recommendation to the General Assembly just as they do in every other instance. But we're, we're highlighting that here in this, in this code section. Chairman Hofford, follow up. Uh, no, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, further questions now? Oh, yes, we do. Speaker Marsh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just I'm trying to understand this because you just said that the executive agency uh, had the power to sign a contract and purchase some products or, or services. Wouldn't that not be what you would want them to do? When they're who who would do that if they didn't do it? I chairman, my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely, we want them to be able to do that. The, the part, again, that was so shocking was that there was not a formalized review process the way there would be. Again, any other single source or no-bid contract typically comes before fiscal review. It's my understanding of it. When I served on it, that's what we reviewed. And so I just asked, because this was in a meeting of fiscal review, don't forget, and the only reason that the commissioner was before us is because one of our dear friends in the media broke a story. So, of course, we did what we do very well in the General Assembly. Is we, we reacted to a lot of hot fire and said, well, we need to bring this person in and ask him questions. I, I shudder to think what would happen if that story had not been broken because we did, we, we had, you know, as, as has been told to me, well, Chairman, every time you asked, you know, to see a contract or to review something, it was provided to you. I wholeheartedly agree. That's why this bill is not aimed at this administration. What if we had an administration that didn't want to share that information? What if we hadn't had a news story breaking it? What if we didn't know the right questions to ask? That's the that's the heart of this piece of legislation. <laughs> Speaker Marsh. Okay, so really what you're saying is we, the governor and this group did not really do anything wrong. They were... they issued contracts, they, they spent money, and we just want to check on the back end that they did things right. And GovOps could tell us they did it right or they did it wrong, and then what happens if they did it wrong? Chairman Curcio. Well, again, this bill doesn't talk about if, if there's wrongdoing. Uh, that, would, that would be a, 
something completely different. This just talks about them giving a recommendation as to whether to continue or discontinue the the agency underneath the emerg the governor's emergency powers. So but you're no, not I, I wholeheart sorry, to I wholeheartedly <laughs> agree that the governor did nothing wrong. That's why this bill is not about our our current governor at all. It highlighted the broad latitude that we've granted. Again, these are not powers. Uh, that, that are typically seated with the executive branch. We gifted them to the executive branch, and I just think that we ought to have some guardrails. Speaker? Well, I, and I agree. I, I think we've got to have a, a leader, a governor that, that leads when we have a, a situation like this, and I think we've got to give them a lot of leeway, and I don't have a problem with us auditing after it's over, but I don't think we need to hamstring them in any way to get the job done. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and thank you, Speaker Marsh. Next, we have Chairman Bricken. Chairman Bricken, you're recognized. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a question after thinking about it a little, a little bit on this. The 60-day period after the agency's creation, well, what happens if that agency really hasn't done anything, but the agency, like you said, might still be in existence nine months the action that we might be concerned with happens in, on day 75. When will this, when would uh, government ops have another chance if they didn't do it, if there was nothing of concern in the first 60 days, but the event occurred later? What, how would we address that? Chairman Curcio. Thank you, sir, for the question. Again, this bill doesn't specifically contemplate that, but as when recommendations come out of GovOps, um, you know, if that, that emergency power continued to be exercised, the General Assembly is then on notice. They know exactly what's going on because the recommendation has come out of GovOps that, hey, there is an executive agency that's been created under the governor's emergency powers, and therefore we are now watching it. That's that is exactly the heart of this legislation. I'm really glad you asked that. Chairman Bricken. Chairman Bricken says no more. Okay, further questions. We're about to wrap this up. Okay, did I get a question or did I hear a question on this? I think I did. I don't see any opposition. We're ready to vote, members. Those in favor of House Bill 1347, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. And Chairman Curcio, congratulations. You are headed to Gov Ops. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your time Appreciate today, Appreciate your indulgence. Sir. Thank you for your time today. We're going to move on now to item number five, House Bill 809. Representative Powell, uh, from your seat, I assume you are recognized, sir. Uh, thank Got you. Got a motion and a second, Representative Powell. All right, proceed, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this bill deals with license plate readers. Uh, license plate reader, readers have been used by law enforcement uh, recent years with great success. And we just want to make sure that the data that is captured uh, using uh, license plate readers uh, for these government purposes is kept as confidential and is not uh, available and open to the public for inspection. Um, because we don't, we want to make sure that um, we're, we're, protecting the privacy of Tennesseans. But, um, you know, these license plate readers have been, uh, as I mentioned, extremely successful tool for law enforcement, uh, can reference different cities that are, that are using this around the state. Uh, most recently, Mount Julia, the city of Mount Julia just put out a release that said, and they adopted license plate readers uh, last year, and they've helped resolve over 100 crimes including recovering 57 stolen vehicles, discovering 30 stolen license plates and two stolen trailers. Uh, additionally, they found 11 wounded people and found a missing juvenile. So this can be used in a, a bunch of different applications uh, by law enforcement for uh, very successful uh, outcomes. Well explained. Uh, members, you have heard an explanation of the bill. Any questions to the sponsor? We've got a question. Call for the question. I see no objections. We're ready to vote. Those in favor of House Bill 809, please say aye. aye. Those opposed like sign the ayes have it. Congratulations, Representative Thank Powell. You, you are headed, sir, to GovOps. Thank you. Moving on, item six, House Bill 1514. It's good to have you, Representative Cochran, in the well today with us. 
I have a motion and a second on the bill, but now you, sir, have an amendment. Yes, Would sir. Would you please, uh, Representative Cox, give us your tracking code, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. The tracking code is 5163. Correct. So do we have a motion and a second on the amendment? We do. All right. We are ready to um, uh, hear, have a, any, any questions to the sponsor on the amendment? We have a motion and a second. I hear a call for the question, and I see no objections. So, therefore, we're ready to vote on uh, Amendment 1, Tracking Code 5163. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like, sign the ayes have it. We now have that amendment. Uh, Representative Cochran, on your bill. Sir, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 1514, um, currently, so the threshold for a city, for a municipality to hold a vote, a liquor by the drink referendum, uh, you have to have at least 925 people. This lowers that to 700, essentially just giving more municipalities uh, c control uh, over their own future and, and how they want to proceed with liquor by the drink referendum. Okay, very good. You've heard an explanation. We've got a question, and I see no objections. Therefore, it allows us to vote. We're ready. Uh, let's vote on House Bill 1514 as amended. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like, sign the ayes, have it. Uh, bill passes, and now you are headed, saddle up. You're headed to Calder and Rules. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Sir. All right. Okay, item number seven. Representative Manus, thank you for being with us today. You're you're going to be bringing House Bill 173, and you, sir, already have a motion, and I heard a second. Wow, welcome, sir. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and committee, and, and it's uh, good to see two of my esteemed colleagues from the best freshman class ever here right <laughs> on the front row. So uh, I have an important piece of legislation here and it enhances our statewide 911 service. That is House Bill 173 requires the Emergency Communication Board to develop a statewide implementation plan to address text to 911 service. As of May 2020, 11 of Tennessee's 911 stations were ready and 38 more were in the process to launch. Uh, we expect full impl implementation date would be January the 1st, 2023. Just a few examples of why 911, text 911 is critical uh, for those with physical limitations such as speech or hearing challenges, medical situations like allergies or strokes, victims who have been abducted, domestic violence situations, human trafficking, and also public space shootings such as schools or shopping centers. 911 is funded by a tax or tariff paid to cellular companies. Last year, the legislature approved an increase from $1.16 per phone per month to $1.50 per phone per month uh, in January in anticipation of the next generation 911. That includes text to 911. It is important that we have consistent 911 service across our state, and this includes the ability to text. It is also the sponsor's understanding that the ECBs will have access to state <clears> funding <throat> for these upgrades. So I'll entertain any questions. Sure, certainly. Very good job. Any questions to the sponsor? We do, absolutely. Representative Powell, you're up, sir. You're recognized. Sure. I, I really do appreciate this uh, piece of legislation. I, I guess I just had a question, and maybe uh, if you're able to answer this. So if, if there was an emergency and I texted, I would literally just text 911, and do they then text back to get location? How does that How does that? They would Representative text back. Minus, you're up. Go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. You would just text, and then they would text back, and you would be able to communicate via text instead of uh, being spoken to. Representative Powell? Great. And and would their uh, system have an ability to, if you if didn't text back, I mean, I know sometimes uh, by accident, I'll try to power off my phone. And I, I know everyone in here is actually probably called with their cell phone, you know, hitting the wrong button and starts calling. You can cancel it quickly. Um, would they know if you didn't text back your location to be able to, to assist? Representative, man. I don't, I can't answer that completely. I would think they would be able to ping your location because I know they can do that. Uh, but I don't have the, the direct answer to that. Rip, pal. Well, I'm that's sorry. all right. Uh, I appreciate the legislation. I'm sure that'll be, you know, resolved or figured out, but I think it's really important. And clearly as we change um, as more people text to have this uh, function 
Um, and then also if people are in really threatening situations and they can't make a phone call, it's a great piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Powell, for the questioning. We're on, moving on to Chairman Brickin. You're recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I fully support the bill, and I think I'll, hopefully all 911 districts will quickly implement uh, 911 texting capability. I, I do want to be certain the sponsor, I think he made a statement about the $1.50 per month per phone bill that uh, it was designated to... Um, help implement this cost again. Uh, so our Tennessee citizens with that $1.50 is paying around $200 million a year into the system. But I want to be sure everyone knows that's only about one third of the operating cost for 911 in the state. It's a 500 to $600 million a year operation. So it's, it's a big deal. A lot of money goes into this service. Um, I do kind of wonder about the ongoing reoccurring cost of text because I generally speaking, once the equipment and operation is purchased in place, I would certainly think that cost should be fairly minimal. But again, I'm not a technical expert there. But again, I just wanted to be certain that I made the statement about the funding sources here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Chairman Brick. And your response, uh, Representative Manis, do you have a response yes. to that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Representative Brick and I had had this conversation, and I confirmed with the Senate sponsor, I shared, uh, Senator Massey, your concerns, and she and I agreed that the ECBs will have access to that state funding for these upgrades. And somewhere in my notes, I asked uh, the Knox County 911 what the ongoing uh, annual expenses would be. And it was somewhere like $10,000. It was, it was small, uh, relatively small speaking. So. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Down front, Chairman Hosequall, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. And again, this, this is a great bill because it came through my committee and, and the people that presented it was awesome. The one question that I have, like if an individual was in an accident and someone else texted that, you know, there needs to be a response. Do we do any kind of additional like sign language training with EMTs or any of that kind of stuff? Representative Manish? I don't, I'm not sure about that. Chairman Holtzclaw, I, I couldn't answer that. That, uh, that may be something good to look into, okay. but thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Now, hey, we're on to Representative Alexander. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Representative um, Manus, I just wanted to say I really love this bill because there are people out there who can't speak. I was on a Zoom call the other day with a special needs girl who could only sign, and she wants this bill because she was in an accident and couldn't let anybody know because she had no way to tell them she would call 911 and they, she wouldn't answer, so they'd hang up. Hmm. So I think it's a great piece of legislation. Thank you for bringing Thank it to you. us. Thank you. Uh, response, Representative Mash? Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. This this bill was brought to uh, Senator Massey and myself from a former constituent of mine who is is in a, a rare situation. She can hear everything. She just can't speak. And so she was in an accident, and she tells the story about she was in an accident with a, a hearse, a funeral hearse, and, and Representative Alexander may remember this. And... Uh, the casket was okay. She the, she dented the hearse, but she was not able to call and report uh, any of those. So it really that's that's where this text to nine one one really came from. Okay. Further questions to the sponsor. Call for the question has been made, and I see no objections. Therefore, allow us to vote on House Bill one seventy three. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. And you, sir, Mr. Man, you are headed on to representative to finance, ways, and means. Congratulations, sir. Next, we are headed to uh, number item number eight. Yes, we are. And that is this distinguished, our own Chairman Carr. Chairman Carr. Look at there. You've already got a motion and a second, sir. Thank you, you Mr. Are Chairman. I see no amendments, members, so you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is sort of a little cleanup bill. In 2019, we allowed the uh, 
uh, higher education to apply for a liquor license under the sports authorities of their schools. One thing that we left out, we didn't uh, uh, put in there, it was only state school. We didn't put any private higher education uh, uh, classes in that. So we're just changing the wording to simply say, and it, all it does is add or private to the to the language, and it's all permissive, and in no way does it make a, a college or a higher institution apply for a, a liquor license. It just makes it permissive for them to do so. And with that, I renew my motion. Thank, thank you, Chairman. My apology to the committee. I failed to announce the bill number, and that's uh, House Bill 1082. All right, you heard an explanation from uh, Chairman Carr. Any questions to the chairman? Got a question, and I see no objections. Therefore, uh, let us vote on House Bill 1082. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign, and the ayes have it. Thank you, Chairman. Committee. All right. Get your traveling pants on. Chairman, you're headed to finance, ways, and means. Item number nine, House Bill 682 by our host legislator, Representative Beck, you are recognized again on House Bill 682. We have a motion. We've had a second. You are up, Representative Beck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a um, amendment traveling. With yes, that. you do. And my apology. Would you give us that tracking code, please? Uh, three eight two zero. You are exactly correct. So let us get a motion and a second. And uh, yes, we do. We have a motion and a second on amendment number. One, those uh, call for question. Would you, do we, would you want to? Let's get a. Let's get this. Uh, we need to get it on the bill here. So, uh, do I hear a call for the question? I do. See no objections. Let us vote on amendment number one. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like sign. We are now. Uh, we have amendment number one now on the bill, and Representative Beck. Thank you, Mr. You Chairman. Uh, this bill concerns uh, the Mother uh, Church of Country Music, the uh, crown jewel of the 51st District, the Ryman Auditorium. The Ryman Auditorium presently is under the Historic Performing Arts Center designation uh, with the ABC. And what this means is after we remodeled in 2015, we added uh, Cafe Lula and Right now, Cafe Lula can only serve alcohol during a performance at the Ryman, and this bill would allow them to serve um, alcohol when there are no performances at the Ryman, and also in the patio area in the parking lot when it's roped off. And with that explanation, Mr. Chairman, I renew my motion. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Any questions to the sponsor? We got a question on the, on the bill. Uh, do we, yeah, we got a, uh, I see no objections. So let us vote on House Bill 682 as amended. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes, have it. And you, sir, Representative Beck, are headed to finance, ways, and means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Sir, thank you. We're now on item 10. That is uh, House Bill 201. Your where is yes from the well, Representative Alexander. You are recognized. Thank I have you, a Chairman. motion and a second. I did got a motion and a second. Thank You're you, recognized. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Um, this bill is for that authorizes the sale of alcohol alcoholic beverages on 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 premises consumption at five locations in Jonesboro the historical Jackson Theater, the Jonesboro Repertory Theater, the International Storytelling Center, the McKinney Center, and the Jonesboro Visitor Center. This will allow them to do it. These are properties that are owned by municipalities, but they will be getting their liquor license in other ways. Okay. You've heard an explanation of the bill. Uh, any questions to the sponsor? I have one. I have okay. one. Jonesboro is officially our... Oldest, oldest town city, in Tennessee, isn't it? Yes, it is. Can you tell us? And I'm not trying to embarrass you, of course, but I, I don't think I can. I bet you'll be able to come up with the answer in years. How old is Jonesboro, Representative Alexander? 
Well, it's the oldest town in Tennessee, and that would be in 1776. So. Wonderful. 1776. So who can do the math real quick? Tell us. I'll recognize them. Just kidding. Let's go. Let's it, move. It would really it, actually be older because it was the state of Franklin before it was the state of Tennessee. That's right. It was, wasn't it? Okay. Got a call for the question, and I see no objections. Therefore, allow us to vote on House Bill 201. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like, sign the ayes. Have it. And uh, Representative Alexander, finance, ways, and means. Thanks. Item number 11, House Bill 404, Representative Carringer. Huh? I have uh, House Bill 404 on your calendar. That'd be number 11. And from her seat, uh, Representative Carringer, you're, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the members of this esteemed board uh, committee that I serve on. Um, I know, I know, that's county, local. I corrected myself. You're fine. <laughs> anyway, you go right ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I bring uh, to you all House Bill 404 that was brought to me by Secretary of State's office, and it primarily relates to the regional library boards. The Department of State believes that it would be more productive and beneficial for the library and archives to eliminate the statutory regional library boards and simply meet regularly with the chairpersons of the local library. So I will present that. And Okay. you uh, Members, you've heard an explanation of the bill. Any questions to the sponsor? We've got a call for the question, and I see no objections. Therefore, let's vote on House Bill 404. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes. Have it. And Representative Kearns, you are moving on to finance, ways, and means. Congratulations. But don't leave that seat. You are up next with item number 12, House Bill 469. And you are recognized, ma'am. Got a motion and a second. All right. With that, we, uh, we're we going to recognize you, okay. Representative Carringer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I bring to you House Bill 469, uh, which was brought to me by the Treasury Department. And they hold the state's unclaimed property and they work to return the property to rightful owners. This bill amends current law to reflect that federal law was recently changed to move the required minimum distribution age from 70.5 to 72. So in summary, the Tennessee Department of Treasury has requested this bill uh, to be carried in order to come in compliance with federal law and to additionally allow for more efficient processing of claims. Very good. Good explanation. Any questions to the bill sponsor? We've got a call for the question. I see no objections. We're going to vote on House Bill 469. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, like, sign the ayes. Have it. And Representative Carringer, you're going to two finance ways and means. Congrats. Item 13, House Bill. Please 1016. And let me let me just pause. Make sure everyone uh, members make sure and those uh, in the in the room, uh, please kill your cell phones. Make sure we have total silence here as we recognize Chairman Hicks. With no amendments to this bill, we have a motion and a second. Welcome, Chairman. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. House Bill 1016 will update the state 401k match for employees in the TCA. Currently, it is set by law at a minimum of $40 per month, but since 2007, the funding has been at $50 per month. This update will bring in line the practice with the required minimum TCA. And with that, I still got a motion. Uh, okay, great. We, uh, great explanation. And we do. We have a uh, Chairman Holtz Claw. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. You know what the note is on this, Representative Hicks? Or Chairman Hicks? Chairman? What the note? Uh, there is zero fiscal impact, sir. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Holtz Claw. Further questions 
to yes, uh, Representative or Chairman Hicks, did you have anything? Yes, I'll, I'll be brief. I was standing in the back of the room when you were talking to Representative Alexander about Jonesboro, and you know Jonesboro has the oldest courthouse in the state. But I'd also like to mention that Hawkins County has the oldest functioning courthouse in the state. Oh, so. interesting. Okay, we'll remember that the next tour we make up that way. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you for that tidbit of history. Or, okay, questions to Chairman Hicks, members. And I heard a, I heard a call for the question. I don't see any. I see no objections. Let's vote on House Bill 1016. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, likes on the ayes have it. And Chairman, you are headed to CNR. Calendar and rules, you know what those initials are thank you mr chairman committee congratulations item 14 oh it is she always this lady always brightens a room we're always proud to have uh chair lady moody with us and she is bringing to us house bill 112 chairman moody or chair lady moody you are recognized we have a motion and a second would you please proceed and present House Bill 112 for us. Yes, and thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, this bill would create the state as a model employer or same. And the program this program ensures that the state agencies and departments design and implement best promising and emerging policies, practices, and procedures related to recruitment, hiring, advancement, and retention of qualified individuals with disabilities. And with that, very good. Okay, you, uh, members, you've heard an explanation of the bill. Those in favor, any questions? Got a question called for, and I see no objections. Therefore, we're going to vote on House Bill one one two. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes. Have it. Stay put. But you are going to take this one to Gov Ops, Chair Lady. You're Thank next also with item number 15, House Bill 530. Got a motion, uh, and I got a second. I see no amendments. Proceed, ma'am. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Uh, this bill seeks to offer reward for information leading to the arrest of any, any individual responsible for the shooting of a law enforcement officer. The reward shall be $10,000 if the officer is injured in the shooting and $20,000 if the officer is killed in the shooting. Very good. Good bill. Any questions to the sponsor? Got a call. Got a, yes, got a call for a question, and I see no objections. Therefore, let us vote on House Bill 530. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. Finance, ways, and means. Thank you. Chair Lady, thank you very much. Item 16. House Bill 1182 by Chairman Rudd. Chairman Rudd, you are recognized, sir. Do we have an amendment? We do have an amendment. Yes, I sir. Need, let's get a motion in a second. Here on that, we do, and now we do have an amendment. Would you give us, Chairman, your tracking code? Yeah, member uh, Amendment 1 is a reference tracking code 4939, and it makes the bill. Correct. You heard the... Uh, chairman, uh, and the tracking code is correct. So let's do we got a motion and a second on the amendment? Uh, yes, we do. We have a motion and a second on the amendment. Any questions to the sponsor on the amendment? None. I see none. Do I have a call for the question? I do. Got a call for the question. I see no objections. Therefore, let us vote on amendment number one, tracking code 4939. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it, and uh, we are moving now on to the bill as amended. Chairman Rudd, you're up. Thank you. I've worked now, with all if I may, and I'm sorry, please allow me to to state to you, Chairman, uh, sponsor, that uh, there there is testimony requested. So therefore, we're going to allow you to go ahead and explain the bill. Just bear, keep in mind uh, that. 
there'll be testimony that follows, and they will withhold any questions to you until that. So, my, I'm sorry. Go go ahead. Proceed, sir. I've worked with all the stakeholders that have contacted me and reached out to me. This amendment reflects the advice of the business community. I think it makes a good bill with all for all anyone who's reasonable uh, that people can live with. It removes the requirement for a notice to be at the entrance of a building, and with only a notice outside the bathroom. Uh, the entrance door of the restroom, with, which has multiple stalls, not a single stall. It also grants a 30-day grace period for property owners to come into compliance if they're notified that the sign or any of the requirements of the bill is, is invalid so that they can't be sued and they have time to adjust. This legislation does not discriminate against anyone. It does not prohibit access to any facility. It does not, and it provides only a notice that a possible, that the opposite sex could be in the restroom. Um, as you enter, if the property owner has that policy in place, and again, it's only in restrooms with multiple stalls. Um, a woman has a right to know if a man is gonna be in her restroom and vice versa for a man. This, leg this legislation does exactly that. Uh, with these changes, the NFIB and the Retailers Association have signed off and deferred. Okay, you've heard an explanation uh, of the um, the bill as amended. And, and, and uh, Chairman, I've got, I've got a question. I want to go back to to those remarks there, uh, and you know, I ask you by using uh, actually uh, my son's office uh, where, where it only has one. Uh, well, we have two. <laughs> he has two restrooms, but only one facility of each one. So that this would not apply then in in that particular case. It's only where we have multi. Um, facilities within a restroom is that that, that is correct on and uh, on properties that have public access to restrooms where there is a single bathroom this would not apply only in multiple stalls because okay. a a person could not the opposite sex could not be waiting on someone male or female um if it's just a single stall because one person goes in at a time this is only in locations where there's multiple stalls and again for the record there's nothing outside that that office that has to be posted for, for public awareness then. That is correct. Okay. And this is only on properties that have that policy to allow the opposite sex in a restroom. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Any questions, follow-up questions to, to the sponsor on the bill? Yes, we do. Uh, Representative Beck, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is What are you going to penalize or what does this bill penalize a company for uh, if they do not follow this uh, posting Regulation. It does not Chairman, provide. Chairman Rudd. It does not provide any uh, any uh, fines or penalties at this point. This is only saying that it's not a legal policy to have. Reps impact. It's, it's not. Excuse me. Not the policy. You have to at least let somebody know. It's just saying you have to have that. If whether there's any um, future action, that would be uh, be determined by the state. Reps impact. So let me get this straight in my mind. So if you have the policy that. Uh, only men can use the men's room and only women can use the women's room, then you do not have to post this. Is that what you're saying? Oh, would you, could you state that again? If, if, if the policy of your company was that men have to use the men's room and women have to use the women's room, then you would not have to post. Is that, is that what you're that saying? That would be somewhat correct. The, 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 the law is opposite of that. It states if you have a policy that where you allow the opposite sex in a restroom, then you have to post if it's multiple stalls and it's available to the public. Representative Peck. So if 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 um, I'm a, a a bar and I say that I have a policy, written or unwritten, that they're unisex bathrooms, then you're saying I would have to, as as the administrator of that that bar i would have to post this this sign according to your bill is that correct chairman rudd yes unless the you actually unless the facility actually had a third bathroom that said unisex representative beck okay well I, i'm getting maybe maybe it's just a little vague to me it, ex, explain to me exactly if if you've got a written or a, or a policy that says what then you have to post this chairman if, if you actually have a policy that allows the opposite biological sex into a restroom, in other words, let's just use it as an example of a man 
allows to use a women's restroom with multiple stalls, then you have to put this sign outside if that's available to the public. Now, if you do not have that policy, you don't have to, you don't have to put a sign outside the door. Representative. Okay. Still seems vague to me, but thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Beck. Speaker March, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. And, and the sign, and what you want on the sign is, if I read this right, this facility maintains a policy of allowing the use of restrooms by either biological sex, regardless of the designation on the restroom. Yes, and with the word notice above it. On the sign, excuse me. Speaker Marsh. I just I, I just don't understand it either. I'm I'm sort of like Representative Beck. It's sort of confusing. I how how will a, a person using the restroom know of what the policy is of the business? Chairman. Well, right now, um, I don't know of, of, matter of fact, I only know of maybe two businesses uh, as far as large retailers. I don't know about small individual businesses in the state. There's only uh, two, I believe, national businesses that have that policy, and they have nothing on their restrooms that I'm aware of, um, except, uh, oddly enough, in California, some of these businesses do put signs on there. It is policies out there. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure... Representative Mars, what you're you're getting at, it's just a simple. Right now, that's not a policy. That's not accepted. In most businesses, if a owner sees a opposite sex going into a restroom, they ask them to leave. Uh, it's very rarely you see that in, a, in an average business. They usually tell them to leave. It's not illegal or not illegal. It's not legal or illegal in Tennessee, but it's a standard practice, and most customers will be feel very insecure going into a restroom with opposite sex. Uh, this just states if a business has an official accepted policy where they allow that, they need to let the public know. Because I think that it's only reasonable in today's society that we would allow, especially a woman, if she's entering her restroom, to know that there could be a man standing there. Maybe that man is no threat, but she at least deserves a right to know that a man could be waiting on her in the restroom. And if she sees that notice, that minimal notice, outside the bathroom door, at least she, if she proceeds to enter, at least she knows what to expect. If she enters a restroom now and sees a man coming out of a stall or comes in and sits in a stall next to her, she might start screaming or feel threatened. And it, it just needs to be a notice so that she has warning. I think that's very reasonable. It doesn't prohibit Speaker, anyone access. Speaker Marsh. Well, now if they allowed that, they would probably have a sign outside the door that had a, a sign of a woman and a sign of a man, so they would know before they went in that it is allowable. That's sure. not required by that's not required by law. And as far as I know, the end the individual stores, the two or three stores that allow that policy now do not have that. Okay, thank you, Speaker. All right, further question. Okay, next we have Chairman Jernigan. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. I got a quick question. It's kind of along with Representative Beck was talking about with enforcement. So uh, it, there's no state department or agency that's going to oversee this. Like Commerce and Insurance is not going to, you really wouldn't know if they have a policy or not unless they see it on a website or it's publicly posted. So there's not going to be. What, what department oversees whether this law is being complied with or not? I guess is my question. Chair, Chairman Rudd. Since, it, since uh, we're not making it, again, we're not making, I could, I could make a law, you're trying to make this law into something that it's not. This mm -hmm. does not outlaw a man entering a women's restroom. It is not prohibited. It's simply requiring a warning sign to be put up. Now, let's say that that is the official policy of the business. They refuse to put the sign up. They number one would be could possibly legally liable for a lawsuit because they they didn't let the woman know that someone other than a transgender was waiting on her in the restroom. Um, the other thing is um, possibly there's no state department overseeing this right now because there's no fine. And I'm trying to make this as a minimal a warning as possible to give women notice. It could very well be uh, that someone could press charges. Chairman Jernigan, then it would be up so to an, a DA to a sheriff and a DA to investigate. I, got, I I think I understand. So you're, there's no enforcement to it, but it could open someone up to civil liability. Well, it could. Right. I mean, this does give a limited outside a restroom. It does give limited uh, liability coverage. I believe you put a sign up, at least you know, you know. I understand. Further questions, Chair, uh, Chairman Jer Jernigan? None. He says. So we are on to Representative Chisholm. You're recognized, sir. 
Thank you, Chairman. To the sponsor, I'm I'm still a little confused here. Uh, <laughs> so with this bill, uh, it doesn't put it doesn't put unisex on on the bathroom, no. or it's just more. It has to have the the restaurants or bars policy on the on the door, Chairman. Well, it's not aimed at restaurants or bars. It's aimed at any property that allows, that's open to the public, that allows opposite sex to use a restroom that has multiple stalls. Most of your smaller businesses only have single stalls. Some just have one restroom. It's open to both one person at a time. And then you also have some businesses that have actually created a third bed, a third bathroom called family or other. So that would, uh, that would and that's usually one, one, bath, one single toilet at a time. It wouldn't be affected by this. Okay, uh, Representative Chisholm. Um, was there an incident that, that 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 made this bill arise, or I'm just, I'm just trying to find uh, where where the bill originated from? Uh, there a Chairman. bill originated from actually a constituent at a fundraiser, a charitable fundraiser, come up to me three years ago and suggested it. And with all the recent uh, executive orders and things coming out of Washington, I felt that it was my responsibility is that our, our responsibility here, as we're always hesitant to pass any new regulation or requirement, except to protect people's rights. And I'm not prepared to sit by and wait for a woman to be scared to death or raped in a uh, bathroom if we don't put this up. She at least needs minimal, and this is what this bill does, it's minimal warning. We just need a minimal warning to women so that they know what could be waiting on them in a restaurant. Representative Chisholm. No, no further questions. No further questions from Representative Chisholm. Next, we have Representative Alexander. You're recognized. Um, Representative Rudd, um, could we not just put, instead of putting language at a door, could we not just put the picture of the girl in the skirt and the boy in the pants and and let that be, you know, it's kind of like if you walk into Starbucks, you know, it could be either person. In Chairman. that bathroom, could Chairman you not Rudd. do that? Um, well, those signs are very vague, and um, there's uh, some of them you can't hardly tell what they are. There's no standard of of what they're described as. As you enter a, a restaurant, restroom, whatever, you have to look at them twice if the letters aren't up there. This just puts a sign up, so at least a small sign, um, so that at least they are made aware of something to read. If it's a symbol, they may not understand the symbol, but if, if it's a minimum notice there, um, and, and that's all that draws attention to that fact. Representative Alexander. Well, my thought was, if a child goes to that bathroom and they can't read, they're not going to know. If you have a picture and they're either a child or they speak a different language, they don't speak English, they know what that picture looks like. I mean, we know, I mean, as... I mean, although I have walked into bathrooms with a man on the front of it and walked right in by accident, not paying attention. But um, it, that's just because I'm blonde. But anyway, <laughs> but I just wanted to know, wouldn't a picture be visible and then there wouldn't be any, any confusion as to what it's about? We put a picture of family and other like they do in a lot of restrooms, like you mentioned earlier. Um, or you, or you just put a picture of a boy or a girl up there on both, and you take your chances. Chairman Rudd. Uh, again, it gets back to uh, the symbols aren't always understood by adults. I think children would have an even harder time understanding a symbol that's vague, and um, and a lot of the ones that have symbols don't put the words women or men on the sign. They just have a symbol. Not everybody may understand the symbol. Um, at least the notice, they know if you put a notice up there, they're going to at least give them a, a, it's a better security, a better warning that at least they know to read the sign. Representative Alexander, follow up? No, sir. She says, no, we are going to move on to Representative Powell. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As this discussion has gone on further, I, I've become more and more confused. And I'm just thinking if if I go back to my own business uh, and and was to try to explain how this would be enacted or what what was to be done under this piece of legislation, I, I'm so lost and I'm have the 
you know, been able to listen to this discussion. I just feel like this is a, a very burdensome to Tennessee businesses. And I, and I, it, and I wholeheartedly agree with the fact that we need to um, protect uh, women in the state and take that issue very seriously. But I didn't hear you point to a, a specific situation where this has created a problem um, in the example that you gave. So I, I guess, you know, this, this just seems like overly burdensome uh, for, for businesses and is, is not really addressing any sort of instance or situation that's been a problem. Chairman Rudd? Well, as I said earlier, I worked with the, uh, this amendment was brought about by the biz business advocates and they're pleased with it and deferred once these amendments were put on place. And it's, and that's, um, it's turned into a better bill. It's a much simplified bill. And, um, uh, I don't, I don't personally see anything confusing about it. Um, it's, it's very direct. It's very short. It's very mental, mentally involved. And, um, uh, it's like I said, I'm, um, I'm very concerned and I want to give women and men, but especially women, uh, every protection I can, at least this is a minimal warning. Yeah. Representative Powell. Yeah. And, and I, I thought you said that the bill was, was brought to you by a constituent, of, um, that, so, I mean, I don't, I've not heard of a big outcry from the business community demanding this piece of legislation. In fact, you referenced a national company that already has a policy. Um, and, and I don't know if this bill in some way would, would, you know, do interfere with whatever they're doing as their policy of their business. I think you said there were two national companies that already have some sort of policy. So I don't know if this is targeted them or what. I'm just so confused. My, my, you know, anything that seems overly burdensome to business, especially in this environment and this the year that so many of our businesses have gone through, I just think uh, is unnecessary. Okay, my, uh, members, I'm, I must remind you, take a look uh, at the, on the wall and your watches. It is eight minutes. We we want to do a wrap. Uh, please let me caution. Let's, let's, let's get this one wrapped up. Chairman Halsley, you're recognized, sir. Thank you. And I understand the bill. Makes sense to me. A lot of businesses now don't care anymore. Uh, this actually happened to a family member of mine at a truck stop, and I complained about it. And uh, the truck, uh, the guy working at the truck stop said, it "Doesn't matter to us. It doesn't matter what bathroom anybody uses. We don't care." So it is becoming a policy in some places where it doesn't matter to them. So uh, I don't see any problem through Bill. Oh, uh, just a moment, please. Uh, do you have a response, Chairman? Yeah. Um, well, thank you, um, Chairman Halsey. Uh, also, to re regard the other one of the two national companies, as far as I know, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even affect in Tennessee because Walgreens uh, only has single stalls. So they wouldn't even have to put a sign up. One person enters at a time, so it wouldn't even affect them. Uh, Chairman Halsey, follow up? Okay, uh, Chairman, uh, Chair Lady Littleton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to just do a little clarifying. These are hallways that you walk in and there's stalls on one side and sinks on the other. And men and women go in the stalls and then come out and use the sinks. So that this is what we're talking about. Chairman. Thank you. I, Do you, I, any response? Then? I, I, well, I couldn't, I don't know if your speaker was, I couldn't quite hear. Oh, what I'm you sorry. Said. I, okay. I'm sorry. Go okay. ahead, um, Chair Lady. Away. I, Chair was lady. Just I was just going to clarify what these bathrooms are. You go around a corner, and there's a hallway, and there's stalls on one side with doors that all the way up and down, and sinks on the other, and it's for everyone to go in. So that's to clarify kind of where the confusion is. It's not the bathrooms where you open one door and go in, and you're in there secluded. These, it's a hallway. The bathrooms are on one side, the sinks on the other, and men and women, children, boys and girls are all coming and going at the same time. Thank you. It, your, your response? As, None? as far as I can determine what you're saying, yes, this would only be where there's multiple stalls in one room. Okay. Uh, this wouldn't be for single entry and single, single at one at a time. That, this bill doesn't cover that. Like I said, this is a very minimal bill. Okay, very good. Chair Lady, quick follow up. None. Chairman Jernigan, final question, please. We're going to wrap it up. I'm going to call for the question here, Chair. Go, go, go ahead, please. I have two questions. One for you, Chairman. Did you not say there was there testimony or no? 
Uh, and my apology, uh, that I have just been informed moments ago, there is no testimony. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yes, uh, my apology. Remember. Well, there just seems to be a lot of confusion about this bill, and I, I just would like to make a motion to send a summer study. Second. We've got a motion and a second to send to sun, summer study, and that is the proper motion and a second. So. With that, I, I uh, the chair's going to call for a roll call vote. Let's do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Robbins, would you proceed, please? Representatives Alexander. Yes. Beck. Yes. Bricken. No. Carr. No. Carringer. Yes. Chisholm? Yes. Cooper? Yes. Halford? No. Helton? No. Holesclaw? <clears throat> Holsey? No. Jernigan? Yes. Johnson? Littleton? No. Marsh? Yes. Moon? Yes. Powell? Yes. Wendell? No. Vice Chairman Eldridge? No. Chairman Keesling? No. Mr. Chairman, you have eight ayes, 10 noes, one present not voting. Okay, there you have it. Motion, motion has failed. We're back. We're back on the bill as amended. We're going to have a, got a call for the question. All right, we do have a call for the question. I see no objection. We are headed for a vote. Those in favor? of uh, House Bill as amended, 1182, moving on to calendar and rules. Please say aye. 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 Those opposed, lock sign. Chair calls for a roll call vote. Clerk Robbins. Representatives Alexander. Aye. Beck. No. Bricken? Yes. Carr? Yes. Carringer? Aye. Chisholm? No. Cooper? Cooper? No. Halford? Aye. Helton? Yes. Holesclaw? Holsey? Aye. Jernigan? No. Johnson? Aye. Littleton? Aye. Marsh? Aye. Moon? Aye. Powell? No. Wendell? Yes. Vice Chairman Eldridge? Yes. Chairman Keesling? Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have 14 ayes, five noes. Okay. The uh, the chair declares this passed. It moves on to cal uh, House Bill as amended, 1182, moves on to calendar and rules. Uh, Chairman, all right. Now, we, we, have, uh, we do have those remaining, those bills that do remain on the calendar will be rolled until to next week's calendar. I need a motion to... Um, we have a motion to adjourn. I got a second. We stand adjourned.